Hi, I'm Mark Medina from the Los Angeles Times, and we're presenting to you another edition of Lakers Roundtable. Uh, this time around, we're going to be previewing the upcoming game tonight between the Los Angeles Lakers and Minnesota Timberwolves, and to catch us up on that matchup and all the storylines heading in, we present to you uh, a really esteemed guest here today, Jerry Zagoda with the Minneapolis Star Tribune. How are you doing, Jerry? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for coming on and sharing your insight here. Um, I know, you know, obviously after the matchup, the, the disparity between the, the Lakers and the Timberwolves speak for itself, but I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of Lakers fans are kind of interested uh, from the pure angle with, with Kurt Rambis assuming the head coaching position, accepting a four-year deal, deal this offseason. Um, what, what stood out to you so far as far as what he's brought to the team? Uh, well, uh, I guess most of just the people here is just, you know, the, the style of play that he brought, the elements of the, the triangle and how that's going to uh, work. Because obviously they don't have Kobe or, you know, Lamar Odom or Bynum or uh, Augusta on this team. And uh, it certainly has been a long uh, slog for them. Uh, there's only uh, four games left, but uh, they need to win one more before this is out here. Otherwise, they equal the uh, franchise record for fewest uh, victories in a season. So, it's been a, a long year for him. Uh, the good thing about it is that, you know, he re- really, with the four-year contract, they, from the very beginning of the season, said this was going to be a season of development and evaluation. So they kind of took the the pressure off themselves and uh, the expectations off themselves. That all kind of changes this summer and going into next year. But uh, um, so far, I guess the biggest thing that surprises me is just how uh, patient and calm he's, he's re- remained throughout all of it. <laughs> Has there been any particular challenge that, that he's acknowledged that, that, that stood out the most in terms of implementing the triangle and just assuming a really young squad? Um, I think just I think probably the biggest challenge was just realizing the complete you know disparity in talent from what he went from last year to, to what he inherited this year, and you know how they've they've got some pieces, but they don't have that uh, certainly not the number one piece and. Uh, you know, you could argue whether it's the number two on, on a really good contending title team. So um, uh, I think that this season has sort of been the the shock of that for them and for him and David Kahn and for them to uh, try to figure out, you know, how they add the kind of player who, as David Kahn said the other day, they, um, you know, they play pretty well for like 40 minutes and then for eight minutes they're absolutely dreadful. And a lot of that is just because they don't have they don't have a bailout player for them. You know, they don't have a guy as Khan said that you know they can get the ball to and just say you know stop the hurting. And uh, you know when Kevin McHale was here and he traded Kevin Garnett away, Al Jefferson was kind of assumed to be that player, and they've kind of decided he's probably a really nice two piece, but he's not that guy. You know, they need a wing player who can uh, score. Whether you know he just see their games in the last couple of weeks where they've played. Uh, Durant one night and Dwayne Wade one night and uh, now Kobe tonight and they need to find, you know, that's what everybody's looking for, but they need to find that kind of player because that's what distinguishes the great teams or the good teams. Speaking of Jefferson, do you, do you happen to know what his status is for tonight's game? You know, I am not sure. I'm assuming he'll play, but uh, I've been busy doing year-end stuff and I didn't go to shoot around today, so um, uh, I, I don't know the um, outcome I will I'll I'll hear in about an hour, but um, uh, I'm I'm guessing he'll play. I know, obviously, it's all relative, uh, especially when you look at Minnesota's 15 and 63 record. But without him in the lineup, they they have been 0 and 5. Um, What particular parts stood out the most as far as what they missed from him whenever he's been out of the lineup? With with Al? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with him, I mean, that's, you know, uh, a guy, I mean, he's as close as they get to it to go to guy, you know, um, you know, but you, you can, uh, put those numbers any way you want. They're owing a lot with, in a lot of situations, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> One fifteen times. So, um, I mean, there's good and bad with him is he's the closest guy to get to, to, uh, you know, a guy to, who, who can bail him out, but he's also a guy who a lot of times when the ball gets to him, you know, that whole passing offense kind of stops or slows down. That's what he needs to get better at. 
I mean, they found when they brought Darko Milicic in uh, in February, you know, that uh, it was amazing how quickly he contributed, which shows you what they kind of lacked for a big guy. And, you know, they got kind of a smart big man who knows how to move the ball and you know, understands the game and uh, just, the, you know, the way the offense functions much better when – when you've got a guy like that, that's what Al's got to get better at. He says he's seeing the game better now that he can watch kind of Darko, but uh, the ball tends to get stuck with him sometimes. So there's good and there's bad. With Darko, is there any development with uh, just his prognosis as far as his future with Minnesota? I know that there were reports, including from yours, that, that mentioned that earlier that he'd return if, if he was guaranteed a starting position and anywhere between 30 and 35 minutes. Has that stance changed in any way or any degree? Well, this week by week, he sort of um, week by week, he is you know softened to the idea of coming here to where pretty much now he, he hasn't really basically completely started to come out and set it, but uh, you know he, he, he he's you know he, he not definitely anyways, but he said that he does want to be here, um, and I'm certain they have great interest in bringing him back. The question is, you know. Well, he played the last two months, months, and he was admittedly out of shape because he hadn't played for three months in New York and had kind of just given up and was, you know, eating cheeseburgers in the locker room before games. And, uh, and then all of a sudden he's <laughs> in here and he's playing 30 minutes a game. But, uh, you know, the, the question is, you know, one, can they um, do something else in the draft or a trade? Uh, he would be the logical guy to bring back. The question is whether he's, uh, you know, played this way because he's played for a contract or not because um, he's an unrestricted free agent as of July 1. But, uh, you know, right now, if I had a guess, I'd say it's a 80% chance that he's back. With, with, with this struggling season, uh, what's the, the one positive development, I guess, if you had to choose from as far as when you, when you look ahead toward next year and, and the years on that you think that the team can build off from? Oh, a couple things. One, uh, Corey Brewer went from a guy where no one knew if he could play at all. It was the seventh pick in 07. Uh, um, you know, being a legitimate candidate for most improved. I mean, he went from being lousy to being pretty good and found a shot and had a, a three and 33 straight games and, um, you know, kind of seemed to find himself whether he's a starter or a contender, who knows, but he's, you know, he's a really valuable 6'9 guy. He's really, uh, long and active. He, play, he can play pretty good defense. He's starting to, you know, what has really happened is he's really slowed down. The first year plus, he got hurt last year and didn't play but, you know, a month. But uh, he was just a wild colt. He, colt. he was wild all over the place. And, uh, um, you know, now he, he's just kind of, you can see the game is, he's slowing down and he's not rushing. He's not so anxious. And uh, that's one development. Um, I mean, two, you know, a couple other things I think they've discovered, uh, at least they have answers on, on things, is that, you know, Mikhail was uh, traded for Jefferson. Next year he drafted Love, and he was sort of building around those two guys. Well, Rambison kind of determined that you can't play those two guys, you know, 30 minutes a game, um, which creates other questions about whether there's enough playing time, enough, you know, starting roles. If, if they basically have decided they need a, a seven-footer back there to anchor them defensively, a guy who can block shots. So that'll be interesting in the summer if they trade one of those guys or both those guys or, or what they do. You know, they claim to be really active. They got three first round picks. They've got uh, 12 to 14 million in cap room, depending on where the cap comes in. Um, and, uh, you know, they've got trade assets if they choose to use them. They've got those two big guys. They've got a European center they drafted a couple of years ago and a guy named Pekovic. They got Ricky Rubens right, although David Kahn swears that, uh, Unless he gets what he calls a stupid offer for him, he won't trade him. <laughs> so um, you know, they've got, they've got some some uh, pieces, and uh, you know, now that they determine they have they need a real center that you know maybe allows them to balance the roster a little bit and trade Love or Jefferson. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's the biggest thing that you know the season has shown for him. Speaking of uh, Corey Brewer, what did you think of the uh, the campaign the team put together with uh, featuring him in that that coffee commercial or, or promo, if you will? Yeah, it was a little it was a little hokey, wasn't it? But it was the, guy, I, I, the question I had is they they did this thing and um, filmed it in the Caribou Coffee and they played it obviously off of Brewer's name. They sent out a pound of coffee <laughs> to all the voting media members and 
they did this thing in, in where he was working in a caribou, and Kurt Rambis was supposedly the store manager. And I asked Kurt if he got paid union scale for it because he's still a member of the Screen Actors Guild. But uh, <laughs> you know, last year it was uh, what was it? it was, they sent out a GPS unit to the coaches to, for to chart Big Al Jefferson's road to the All Star Game in Phoenix, which didn't work. And with Kevin Love, they did uh, they sent out a window of glass cleaner. You know, get it, the rebounder for for media right, members. And right. There's actually, if you go to the, I think it's called BrewersBlend.com. If you go and you watch the video, there is a little passing there with someone. I think it's Wayne Ellington walking by, holding, carrying. He's, he's cleaning up and he's carrying the Kevin Love glass cleaner. So, if you try out for you'll <laughs> so see. They're definitely, happy. they're definitely not short on ideas here. Yeah, no, they they like they like those kind of campaigns. So. Uh, see, we'll see what they do next year if they get lucky and what, if there's a campaign for Evan Turner or John Wall. <laughs> yeah, they could uh, they could definitely use those, uh, either one of those two players uh, on their lineup here. Uh, you, you mentioned Kevin Love, obviously uh, a lot of interest uh, out here being from UCLA. Um, I know it, it was noted that uh, you know he's spent a considerable amount of time on the bench since January 18th, but he made a start against Golden State. How's he handled that role, do you think? Um, he's handled it uh, maybe not the happy soldier, but the quiet soldier. You know, He hasn't really complained. He's kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit about it publicly to, to us uh, media types, but hasn't really come out and uh, um, probably has said everything he's, he's feeling. But uh, you know, it's going to be the interesting thing. We're going to have all these exit meetings next week with, uh, with players and um, – you know, I asked Con about it, and he said, "You know, it, it doesn't this this re- realization that they need a real center. It doesn't mean that you know they're going to trade Jefferson or Love, but he says there will be will have to be you know kind of sacrifices made in terms of playing times and roles, although not necessarily in terms of accomplishments. But it'll be interesting if you can get you know one of those two guys to agree to that. I mean, you know, either you start Love or Jefferson, most likely Love, and you know start the real center, whoever it is, Milicic or you." And kind of a token thing, you start both of them and quickly go to another guy to bring them in because they've concluded that those guys are too short and too slow to guard pick and rolls and defend and, and keep anyone from getting to the getting to the rim. And, and one last thing here, you look at the previous two matchups this uh, this season with Minnesota and the Lakers. A few interesting twists in each game from the, from the Lakers and the, the first meeting. Um, and their 104 92 victory on December 11th. That's the game that, that Kobe Bryant wound up fracturing his right index finger. And of course, uh, the most recent victory um, on February 19th was when Andrew Bynum uh, strained his left Achilles tendon. But both games, uh, at certain points, Minnesota was in contention in those games. What did you draw from those two contests as far as uh, their effort was concerned and, and it just not being enough? Well, um, part of it is, you know, this team has, has had a tendency to play up to the level of its opponents. And, you know, when they get to the Staples, I know the last time it was on a Friday night, the crowd and all the celebrities were there, and they just, you know, brought a little more um, emotion and uh, energy. And I'm sure for the Lakers, they're going, fine, you know, we can win this game is- easily. So, uh, uh, you know, they didn't get really interested until they really needed to. So, um, I don't think the outcome was ever in doubt, but at least they were close games you know, as opposed to the 41-point game they lost at Golden State in, uh, in um, November, and they lost by 38 in Phoenix, I think, right before they played the Lakers. So um, uh, and I, think, and I think part of it is it's kind of interesting because, you know, they're, they they claim that it's easier to play against the Lakers because they know what the Lakers are going to do because they understand the triangle, which they did a year ago. So, um you know, I think part of it is they get more interested and and play better, um, and uh, you know, Lakers kind of play down to them, and uh, it's uh, I think it's a little bit interesting that you know both teams sort of know what the other teams are doing because I think those are the only two. I think when first time they played the Lakers, they said you know we've never really had to prepare for another team that plays. I mean, they don't play the true triangle, but they play enough elements of it that that it's uh, uh, close enough. All right. Well, thanks a lot for for all your insight uh, again, and and we'll be looking forward to what all, all unfolds tonight uh, when the Lakers and Minnesota square off again. That's yeah, funny. It's taken all the way to April 9th to get the first visit of the year by the Lakers. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess uh, I guess they came at the right time where it's not as cold, right? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably I don't know what it is today, but it's you know it's it was 81 last week, so the snow's all gone. Gotcha. Yeah, that's uh, is, is that been a major adjustment for our Coach Rambich? It's not uh, you know just being spoiled, used to being spoiled out here with the the clear uh, sunny skies in LA and having to brace for the the cold winters. I think I think so. Although he claims that he likes it, but uh, uh, you know, he uh, I think it was a bit of a shock to him the first couple times that we got the really cold snows and you know the first kind of. On Christmas, when we sort of got uh, 10, 12 inches of snow on Christmas Eve, so um, I know he likes those return trips when they're out in L.A. and he gets to go stay at home in in Manhattan Beach. (laughs) I'm sure he's uh, bundled up on a lot of coats uh, since he's come out here, but again, uh, this has been uh, Jerry Zagoda with the Minneapolis Star Tribune offering his insight on the, the upcoming matchup between Minnesota and the Lakers. Thanks again for your time. Thank you.